Hi, I'm Tower Specialist Jeff Merrill, and I'd like to introduce you to my good friend, Douglas Cochran. Jeff and I have teamed up to make a series of videos called The Physics of Docking. Episode 10, Tying to a Cleat. And this is yet another in our sequence of videos about docking. This will be a short one in which we talk about how to tie a dock line to a cleat. This may seem like a mundane subject, but it's important for a couple of reasons. The first reason is obvious. We need to secure the, our vessel to the dock so it will hold in all conditions. The second is less obvious, but equally important. We need to tie all lines in a consistent manner so that we know how to untie quickly, even in the dark. Douglas, you've obviously given this a lot of thought and this docking thing has a lot of moving parts. One of the non-moving parts are cleats. And you we wanna hope. make sure, we hope, yeah. You wanna make sure, I mean, I've been to docks and marinas where the cleats were barely holding in. You can't just assume that the cleat is fine, but let's let's do assume that the cleats are gonna hold and you're gonna tie your boat off. I know you have your own ideas on how to cleat off. What? Tell us how you like to do the cleating. Well, in my opinion, there's two ways to cleat a boat, my way and the wrong way. <laughs> okay. And by that, I don't mean that uh, other boats can't use a different way, but every boat needs to be consistent so that you know how the, how the boat is cleated because if there's a, an emergency and the natives are restless or there's a fire on the dock or something, you, or it's dark and you're leaving, you need to know how that boat was tied up so you can quickly get it off again. Well, if you're going from cleat to cleat and you're the one untying, it's nice to know that each time you untie it, you're untying the same knot as opposed to some spaghetti factory wraparound job. Exactly. And something we often do is make the last line off go around the cleat and back onto the boat so that whoever the dock hand is doesn't end up blowing watching the boat drift away right you can you can ease that last one out and just pull the tail in and and, yes. and, and you can do it from on the boat from not on, on the, the dock yeah exactly. that, that's a good point yep okay so here's an example of a cleat that's tied up now this is not what i would call a properly tied cleat first of all it's wrapped around and around and around so if i want to undo it first i got to find the end of it then I got to figure out how it's wrapped. And then in this case, the thing was never even locked down. So even though it looked like it was really tied up, there was nothing to hold it. If, that, if the boat was rocking back and forth in a surge, it would very easily have come loose and you'd be adrift in the middle of the night. So let me show you uh, the proper way to cleat a boat, in my opinion. You, you have two ears, you go around one ear, you go around a second ear. Then you cross over and you cross over again, making a figure eight. Then you lock it. So what you do is you put a twist so that the bitter end is underneath and you do that again. So it's underneath again. That is, gives you two locks and it will give you, that's all it takes to really hold a boat in almost any conditions. We always go clockwise. Now, if you're a left-handed boat, you can go counterclockwise. But if you go clockwise, you go around an ear around another ear, cross over, cross again, and then lock down and lock again. Now the advantage of this is it comes off easy because you've got these, these two cleat, the, the locks are separated from the tension. So everything that gets tight is below that. So it's easy to get the locks loose and the, the line is unlikely to jam. is that instead of using this on the cleat on the dock, this is the eyelet, is you, you simply pass the eyelet through. The dock hand wraps that around an ear and locks it, and you control everything from inside the boat. You, you do the cleating off in the boat. The last line that comes off is typically the midline or the stern line, depending on your boat. But if, if you want the midline to be the one and you're gonna enter on this gate, what happens is you, first of all, it's hard to get this line off. And secondly, once you have it off, the boat is free and it goes away and you're standing on the dock. And it's not a very nice day to get back to the dock, but your captain sort of has to come get you, right? So what we'll often do is before we leave, 
We'll take this off and pass this end back through. We'll clean it off on the inside. That way, when all the other lines are loose, the deckhand can step aboard and from safely in, on board, untie the line, give it a flip to get it off the fleet, and you're on your way without leaving anybody behind. So these are some of the things you want to think about with cleaning your boat. Consistency, simplicity, and safety. Those are the things that are most critical in, in cleaning a boat. Douglas, I think probably one of the scariest scenarios that any owner, operator, husband, wife, crew can be in is a man overboard situation. And you definitely need to be ready for that with a, a life sling and a, and a way of getting somebody out of the water and a swim ladder that'll go in the water. But a lot of the techniques that we've been talking about on docking would come into play in a, a, a retrieval recovery man overboard situation. Now, obviously in a marina, you have flat water, it's calm. If somebody falls overboard, you're probably outside. It's, in a, it's a rougher sea, but what, what are some of the things that you think about when you prepare for a man overboard situation so that you're ready for it? Practice, practice, practice. That's the key. Do you do the swimming or does Jerry do the swimming? We, we use a little fender. Okay, well, that, no, that's smart. You, you're a smart guy, okay, good. But no, it, the, the main thing is to, to do it enough times to where it isn't a panic situation. And so practice over and over how to do it and time yourselves as you do it so you are confident that you can get back to somebody. You know that it's a five minute or a 10 minute or whatever the interval is. One or two minutes, I don't like being in the water. Yeah, so. right. Well, you get hypothermia kicks in and a lot of things. We don't have time to go into all the details, but I know one of the techniques that I've talked to clients about is you have the type four throw ring as a requirement. If somebody falls overboard, you can throw them the ring, and if it's daylight and they didn't hit their head when they went in and they weren't wearing a life jacket and they can find it, finding that ring is one thing, but uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the people that I'm working with, we talk about adding some polypropylene floating line and a strobe light, so that if you throw all that apparatus overboard, you've got a floating line, you've got the life ring, and you've got the strobe light, you've got more to kind of grab to at least have a, a flotation deal while you're coming back to recover them. And part of, part of practice is to get used to the idea that you, you hit the man overboard mark on your chart. So you have a, a mark on the chart. Yeah, but, yeah. You check your compass so you know which direction you need to return back to get, to get back to them. And then most importantly is you take the, a moment to take a deep breath. Don't panic. I've done this before. Now it's real. Let's do it. Let's do it the way we know how to do it. Well, one other point I want to make is five honks on the horn signals danger and it would let any other boaters around if you're lucky enough to have other boaters. But the other thing is to let the person in the water know that you saw they went overboard. They'll probably hear one or, or, or more of those blasts. Yes, be encouraging to them to know that somebody yeah. knows that they're out there. Hopefully we never have to deal with a man overboard situation in real life, but we need to be prepared for it. We've, we've talked about a couple things you can do. The, the method for coming back to retrieve somebody, I think, is very important. The only clue you really have in the water is your wake, which may be a race in a big sea, but there's a Williamson turn you can do. Uh, you like to just pivot right on place because you want to come back in, a, in, a, in the straight line of which you are coming, so you note your compass course and you, you get the reciprocal course. What other uh, aspects of man overboard? You, you, you've got some, some games you've played, haven't you, to, to practice? Well, yes, uh, we, we on our boat uh, played the man overboard game. We had a, a float with a loop uh, on it so we could easily retrieve it with a boat hook. And the game was that anybody on the boat uh, would go look around, make sure there's no other traffic to disrupt, and then they'd pitch it over and they'd yell, man overboard, and then that person is out of the game. They're overboard, other than they check their watch to see... How long the response time is? Yeah, how long does it take to save me? You know, and, and if I saved you in two minutes and took you five minutes to save me, then we need to talk about this some more. How we can improve it, yeah. Okay, yep. that's interesting. I don't like being wet. No, no, okay. Well, and that way no one gets wet or hurt if you're, uh, if you're throwing over a, a buoy or something like that. Yes. Good. Now, the one other thing you need to think about with this is that oftentimes by the time you get to the person, they're incapacitated. They're too cold, they've swallowed some salt water, they're they can't help you come back out of the water. Yes. Yeah. So you need to, on your boat, think about how am I going to get a, a, a large wet object onto the boat 
without pulling you back into the water as well because you could really, particularly if it's two people, one person's in the water, they're really helpless and you're driving the boat, trying to make sure you don't crunch them when you come back to them, trying to get them back on. There's a lot to think about here. Yes, yes, it's, it's the, the best answer is don't go overboard. Of course. So the rule we had is you, you never go forward to the Portuguese bridge and you never go onto the aft cockpit unless you have permission from Well, and if you're going to go offshore, you can wear one of those inflatable life vests. And, and if you do go outside, you tell somebody, you check out and you check in and you yes. watch them. I, I know there's some cruisers who will run a jack line, a, a, you know, a piece of webbing along the boat and you clip into that whenever you go outside. You don't need to go outside. If you do, you make sure someone's watching you. And then you, if they do go overboard, you know. But if they're tethered in, if they're wearing a harness, you're prepared for the worst case situation. That's right. And the nice thing about Nordhavens is that the, the side decks are narrow, the uh, bulwarks are high. You have to really work at it to fall off one of these boats. Right, and we're not gonna talk about the fact that there's a Coast Guard statistics about most men who are found overboard are found with their zipper down because that's a little bit uh, beyond the PG we're trying to keep this thing. But keep that in mind, if you do fall overboard, make sure you zip up your pants so you don't end up being one of those statistics. <laughs> Good point. All right. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching the Physics of Docking. We have enjoyed putting this series together. Douglas Cochran and I thank you for your time. If you'd like to watch the entire series, you can click on the card above. We have other videos available on the JMYS YouTube channel. Thanks for coming back to watch them. We look forward to hearing from you when you have comments. We love your thumbs up, and we enjoy putting these videos together. Hey, great to be underway again out on the water. Love it out here. Thank you very much for watching the video. We have a couple of things you can do. One thing is you can click the bell to get a reminder when we post the next video. We love it when you give us those thumbs up. And then you can subscribe by clicking the button below. Once you've seen a couple of videos, you might also want to check out some of the other ones. So you can click on one of these videos on the side. Thanks, we hope to have you come back here soon and we'll be putting up more content shortly.